Welcome to Beyond Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Petralis, and, and I'm so excited. Uh, you know, I just want to take a minute. I usually don't do this a lot, but uh, today marks a six-month period of this podcast. And when I think back to this podcast and getting it started and, and researching how to, how to build one, um, I never really thought getting to this level in the amount of coaches that we've had on and successful coaches from, you know, league champions to state champions to coaches of the year. Uh, people have been doing it for a long time. And over the last few weeks, really getting some high quality guest on here. Last week, I had our first professional uh, athlete in Chelsea Goldberg, uh, who played on the NHL Network last night. If you watched the PWHPA last night play, uh, she played a great game. It was a fun game to watch. I watched it with my family. It was awesome. Um, but being at that six month mark, I couldn't think of a better coach of halfway through a, a year of this show to have on than this guest that I have on today. This guest is just, if you look at this coach's resume, it is through the roof. And there's probably some things I'm leaving off of here just because we could have a whole podcast on this. Um, but tremendous coach, tremendous guy is the head coach. And this is our first ever professional coach on the show. So I'm super excited. Uh, head coach at the Boston, well, the Cannons Lacrosse Club now, uh, director of uh, the Elite 100 Lacrosse, and we're going to be talking about that on the podcast today a little bit, um, was the end as the current Endicott College Associate, uh, Associate Director of Athletics, excuse me. Um, he was the head coach of lacrosse at Endicott from 1998 to 2015 with an overall record of 243 and 95, an extremely impressive record. Um, it was a 2008, and coach, if I read this wrong, I, I apologize, field turf. I am LCA Division Three Coach of the Year, four-time Commonwealth Coast, uh, Coast Conference Coach of the Year. I'm only halfway there, guys. Uh, New England Intercollegiate Lacrosse Association Coach of the Year in 2015, and then the same thing in 2015 as Man of the Year. Um, ranks 13th all-time in winning percentage for Division Three coaches, ranks 16th all-time in wins among NCAA Division Three coaches. So extremely impressive. And just last year's New Balance is 2020 Coach of the Year. Whew. All right. I, I read it all there, but just an incredible coach, incredible person, and just so excited to have on the podcast today. Ladies and gentlemen from the Cannons Lacrosse Club, Sean Quirk. Anthony, thank you for that introduction and uh, a pleasure to be on your show and congratulations to you on the six month, uh, Mark. I really enjoyed watching and listening to uh, your podcast the last several months. So congratulations to you and thanks again for having me. I I'm looking forward to having a great conversation uh, this evening. Absolutely. Me too. I've had this one circle for, for quite a while. So I, I'm as excited as you are. So um, I want to jump into it because we have a lot to talk about with you. And, you know, I want to kind of get back and go into your college playing days. I know you were an extremely good lacrosse player. We're going to get into the stats in a few minutes at uh, Springfield College. Uh, I had an older brother who went there for a couple of years. So I'm very familiar with the school and where it is and everything else. Beautiful campus, everything. Um, talk about for young athletes out there, young lacrosse athletes, or just young athletes in general, the process that you went through as far as making a decision of which school to be playing at collegiately to kind of get your career to that next step? Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, uh, I graduated from Cheshire High School in 1991. So the landscape in the recruiting process was quite different then. There was no club lacrosse. There weren't many club sports, um, you know, in any sport, really. And there weren't a lot of recruiting showcases and that sort of thing. So I knew at a pretty young age that I wanted to play sports in college, you know, preferably lacrosse. Uh, my brother, Brian, who's six years older than I, played Division I lacrosse. And I kind of always envisioned myself playing at the next level. Um, and in high school, Anthony, I just had an unbelievable coach who was really – I learned a lot from lacrosse wise, but looking back now, and I certainly realized that then as well, I learned so much about the game of life through him, uh, Paul Adams. And he ironically was a Springfield College grad. Um, and I, I looked at a number of schools, some division one, some division two, and, and some division three. And I really always kept coming back to Springfield for all the right reasons. I, I didn't go there just to be a lacrosse player. Uh, it's a big phys ed school. They turn out a lot of coaches at all levels. And I had a sense in high school that I wanted to get into coaching. 
Uh, and I thought I had that sense because of Coach Adams. You, you know, I just saw what he did every day and his passion and his love for his student athletes. Um, that, that's ultimately what drove me to Springfield. Uh, Coach Bugby came to some of my games, started recruiting me. And, you know, one thing led to another. After all those visits to different schools, that's where I committed to. And um, I think it's really important for young athletes to – it's a stressful process, but to really look at institutions for all the right reasons and to find that fit for 20 different things, not just athletics. Yeah, it, it was a great decision for you, right? I mean, just in general, going through that process as, you know, an athlete, it's, you know, everybody wants you, everyone's saying all the right things, but it's what best fits you and what best fits your personality and your style. So when you just see something, you just know. Um, and your career was obviously phenomenal. I mean, we'll talk about 94 first and we'll talk about 95 after, but 94, you guys won the uh, Division II lacrosse championship. Uh, you as a junior goalie. Um, talk about that experience of making this choice to go to Springfield. Obviously, you knew they had a pretty good program. Um, but like anybody else, they go, they always want to do better and get to that next level. I mean, talk about those first couple years as a freshman and sophomore, and then maybe that junior year when you guys, you know, hit the field to maybe say, hey, this, is a, this is a pretty good lacrosse team here. Yeah, sure. It's, uh, you, you know, I, I think everyone, when they're going to play at any level in college, um, you're kind of the big fish going into the pond again, right? And uh, I became a, a little fish and humbled pretty quickly my freshman year. There, there was a, a number of goalies that were there, um, one who was a, a junior starting over me a, as a freshman. And I just kept looking at it and saying, just compete, just compete, just compete and get better. Um, and you never know when your day is going to come, right? It may be in two years when that guy graduates, you, you may beat him out. There may be an injury. There may be a situation. So I played four minutes total my freshman year in college, and I always just kept that drive going of, of getting better every day um, and went home that summer and said, you know what, I got to continue to work hard because I got another year of pushing this starter that's ahead of me. And, you know, one thing that happened come the fall season, we have fall ball at the college level being a spring sport, is that starting goalie didn't return back to Springfield that fall. And, uh, you know, there were other goalies on the roster, and I ended up winning the starting job. And the thing that my coach said to me is, Sean, you really prepared for this moment. You didn't sit back and wait for him just to graduate and that sort of thing. That would have been a disservice to me because uh, I wouldn't have been prepared to play at that high of a level, but it would have been even a bigger disservice to my teammates that I wouldn't have been able uh, to perform at a high level. So I became the starting goalie my, my sophomore year. Um, and we had a, a really solid year. We, you know, played in the ECAC championship at, at that time. And the camaraderie, the, the team that we had was just really, you could feel it building towards something special that we all trusted one another. We, we all really had a lot of respect for one another. And that started with our head coach, Coach Bugby. Um, and obviously then that led to our junior year where then we did win the Division II National Championship. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, every college kid's dream is to go to whatever school they go to and win that national championship. So we'd be able to do that. But not only in 94, but in 95, you guys went back to it. And unfortunately, it wasn't the same result as it was in 94. But an amazing thing that turned out of that, and I know nothing outweighs team accolades, but as an individual accolade that year, you won Division II Goaltender of the Year. Um, I mean, talk about winning an award like that when you as a kid, you work so hard at that sport and, and goalie's not easy in lacrosse. I mean, I played in middle school. That's about as far as I can talk to you about. And sometimes nobody wanted to play goalie. You had to draw sticks. And I got it one time. I dressed up like I was in a medieval fight wearing a suit of armor. I had pads on everywhere. So it's a scary, scary position that, you know, guys are throwing the ball pretty hard and girls are throwing the ball pretty hard. So first I'm just going to ask you winning an award like that. Talk about how amazing that is, but but also maybe we can go a little further backwards in your decision to becoming a goaltender. Sure. Um, you, you know, my decision to becoming a, a goaltender was, it's an interesting story that I started playing lacrosse in first grade. I mentioned my older brother, Brian, who was a midfielder and 
played at the highest level of Division I. He, he was a great player, great shooter, uh, great role model to me growing up. And I started off playing midfield. I, I played midfield from first to seventh grade because I always tried to emulate what he was doing on the field. And in seventh grade, I was going for a soccer tryout at my junior high school, and the school nurse detected uh, an irregular heartbeat, um, which led to me having open heart surgery that fall of my seventh grade year. And I came back from that open heart surgery, and I never was a great runner. Um, you know, always, always a pretty good athlete, right? But I never was like, I never had the stamina to, to always run. So when I came back from that surgery and, and I was healthy, I just picked up a goalie stick. I, I thought it was kind of cool looking, to be honest with you. It was different. Um, and I tried it out and my brother just would get in the backyard and he would shoot on me and I loved it. I loved it. I thrived off of the pressure um, of having, you know, that leadership role, even at a young age. And as I got to high school, I started to develop. I had some really good goalie mentors, John Yeager and Paul Schmoller, who, who really helped me excel at my technique and my craft of being a goalie. But I, I was playing in college summer leagues with my brother through eighth through high school. So I was exposed to a high level. So it forced me to, uh, to get better pretty quick, you know, and I just love the position. Obviously it's, I really look at it as the best position in all of sport. It's kind of like a quarterback in football with that leadership role and directing traffic and that sort of thing. Um, so I've always just loved the position. And, you know, when I, Got to college, like I said, I just wanted to work hard and try to earn a spot and try to earn that starting spot. Honestly, I've never really looked at individual accolades as anything. I just don't, I still don't because it's about the team and it's about growing as people. And you know, even at the professional level, it's about the locker room and that camaraderie and trust and respect and accountability and I think if you have all those things, you're going to win championships. And those accolades, they're going to come to individuals. Um, you know, so obviously I was proud to win goalie of the year and be an All-American and those things. But I would give anything to have won that 95 national championship over any sort of individual accolade. I watched that game with my kids and my wife. Uh, during COVID for the very first time. I, I hadn't watched it in, I'm not a mathematician, but since 1995, we played that game. I, I literally haven't watched it. Um, and, and that loss, it still stings, you know. Um, and that championship that we did win, you know, we, we talk about that a lot with my buddies and former teammates that I'm so tight with. Um, but that's just the way I've always viewed things is, is team first and individual accolades and that sort of thing second. Yeah. I mean, I, listen, that's a college coach's dream to hear that right there. Right. And I think that's part of the reason why Springfield, your junior and senior year had a lot of success. They had great leadership in you. And that was your mentality there. And I think when the leader and the mentality, and it seems like you said, a lacrosse goalie for all intents and purposes is like the quarterback out there, right? It has the most attention in a way. If your leader, your quarterback is the guy who's acting like that, then everybody else falls into line. So I think that attitude is what, you know, really helped with the success at Springfield when you were there. Um, did you know John Cena there? Did you uh, ever, ever meet John Cena there before? He, uh, he, he was uh, a, a couple of years younger than I. Okay. He, he graduated with my brother-in-law who went to Springfield. He lived on his floor. Um, so he, Cena was there at Springfield when I was coaching at Springfield after I graduated. That's so funny. I'm just a big wrestling guy. I was just curious. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, so I know obviously a couple of years, like you just mentioned, you stuck on as an assistant and, um, you know, really helped out with the program. But in, I just have my notes here, in 98, um, the, the Endicott College uh, 
lacrosse coach position opened up and, and you went for it and just doing my homework. It seemed like it wasn't a very big program at the time. It was maybe like 19, 20 kids. If I, if I did my homework right in the program, when you took over. So again, I'm going to kind of ask you a question in two parts. I mean, one, talk about the interest and why Endicott was it just a job that maybe popped up that you went to go for, or was there a specific reason for it? And two, you know, the interview process itself. I mean, talk about a college interview process and what ADs are really looking for, you know, when it comes to hiring the right person. Right. Uh, you know, when I left Springfield after my graduate assistantship there and, um, you know, it was time to move on to that next job. Uh, I would have loved to stay at Springfield and coached a long while more with Coach Bugby, but you move on from those grad programs. And I started just kind of using a network that I had developed from working my college coaches summer camps and had talked to some different coaches at different schools. And it was like the recruiting process all over, right? Now you're going to look for that, that job to, to grow your resume and gain experience and, and learn the intricacies of coaching and the sport even more and, and developing student athletes. Um, long story short, I, I ended up accepting a position at the University of Notre Dame as an assistant coach. And at the same time, the Endicott job had opened, well, and I was interviewing for that at that time as well. Um, I was not offered the Endicott job initially. Somebody else was. And that candidate turned down the Endicott job. And Larry Heiser, who was the athletic director and a Springfield grad at Endicott, then called me and said, are you interested? And um, ultimately, I knew that I wanted to be a Division III head coach. I wanted to build a program in, into a national contender, and I wanted to be in, to, in New England. So again, it was that fit. I didn't feel like I had to go coach Division I. Um, it's not that I'm not that competitive and have that drive to be at that level. I just always believed it in the division three philosophy and that's where I wanted to be. So I accepted that position. Um, the candidate who was going to be, that was offered the job at Endicott actually ended up going to Notre Dame and took that job. Oh, wow. uh, so we kind of flip flopped and uh, he and I actually coached it at Springfield for, for the two years and are great friends. So, yeah, I went to Endicott. It, it was the right fit. Uh, Brian Wiley, who was the head coach for two years before I got there, um, left. I came in. He then actually became the athletic director and is, still is. So he and I work hand in hand every day together. Um, and Dr. Wiley, who was the president, the reason I took that job was because of his vision of what Endicott could be as an institution, what his vision for athletics was, and that sort of thing. And it's one of the greatest success stories in higher education in the Northeast, really. And I've been really proud to be there for, for 24 years, you know, now in the capacity of an athletic administrator. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And, and I, I, with your social media and Endicott in general, I mean, I follow being a football coach, the Endicott football page a lot, and they're always putting their players out there and videos out there. And really, it, it has that like D1 feel to it. You know, sometimes it's the social media stuff's just amazing, you know, to, for a recruiting chip alone. So it's awesome. Um, and you obviously start out kind of what your vision was. You wanted to take over a program and build it into a national con contender. And that's what you did. I mean, three years after taking the job is when you won your first league title. Um, talk about, you know, because when you look at that, I mean, that's your juniors and seniors that were maybe freshmen when the program started or recruits that you had brought in maybe after year one or year two. I mean, how do you then go to work and say, okay, I'm going to build a small program into this national, you know, contender that I want to? You know, I was really blessed that, you know, I mentioned Brian Wiley was the head coach and our roster was small. We had, like you said, 18, 20 guys, but they were really talented players um, and a really tight group. You know, I look back even now, those guys are all in each other's weddings. Uh, it's a really tight alumni group from way back then still. Um, and we just went out and tried to recruit the, the best, again, fit for the institution guys that loved Endicott, that it was the right place academically, 
with our internship program and certainly lacrosse. And we built upon a culture that I still just live by of trust, respect, and accountability. And the guys had success. You know, I had a, a lot of great assistant coaches along the way that mentored these young men, um, a, a lot of great players that bought in to what we were doing. And, um, you know, I, I was really fortunate for all those years to, to coach a lot of great young men and, and obviously have some success along the way. Yeah, and success you had. So, you know, I kind of looked at your coaching career and I pinpointed a four-year window that I felt like you guys just rock and rolled. Um, and so first, let me, let me just say this. You guys, in your, in your conference, you know, you won conference championships, 01, and then you won 04, 05, 06, 07. And that's the years I'm going to highlight in a few minutes, um, 10, 11, and 15. So that's pretty impressive for maybe half the years you coached in that conference. You either won a championship, or you were right there in contention to win a championship. Um, so in that 04 to 07 run, you know, 04, 12 and 7, 05, 15 and 4, 06, 14 and 5, 07, 16 and 3, with an overall record of 57 and 9 during that four year window. I mean, talk about that four years of the Endicott Lacrosse program. What was different that now you had a consistent contender every single year and maybe now six or seven years into your coaching career and having that culture built? I mean, what was the change that you saw? Yeah, I, I think winning that first championship in 2001, you know, it was three years after I'd been there. We'd won the Commonwealth Coast Conference Championship. We got the automatic bid to the tournament and, and we got smacked in our face by Middlebury, who I think, I don't know if they won it that year, um, but they were in the national championship game minimally. And I always look back at that experience. We lost the, we, we went up, I think, 2-1 in the game. And I'm like, all right, we're going to hang with the big dogs here. And we ended up losing 29 to three. And I, I think through that failure, you know, it's something I, I talk a lot about with certainly my players and my athletes and my coaches. And when I give talks is you got to fail to succeed. I really believe that. And, and failure and adversity is something that I just thrive off of. When I fail or, or hit adversity, I just push through it and nothing's going to stop me. That's the mentality I have going forward. So I think winning that championship, you're at a high point. You go to the NCAA tournament, you get smacked in the face. It drives you to recruit more, to work harder, to continue to build. And I think at the same time, high school student athletes saw that we won our conference championship. So those years simultaneously after that, that you mentioned, um, our recruiting was elevated. And that was a, a tribute to those players that came before them. Um, and we really just got a next level player, you know, Kevin Lally, who was, I think, second on the all time leaders list in division three history in, in assists. He, he was a multiple team, all American, uh, a captain. And I could name dozens and dozens of, of players um, that just really built that program to get to where it is even today with Eric Haggerty being the head coach now, um, that guys just bought in and we did, we, we ended up having a lot of success and that's because we had really good players. Yeah. You know, it, it's a mix of all that, right. You know, having good coach and good players, kids who listen to be able to execute, that's the best part. So I know in your league, you had a record of, I believe, and I'm checking my notes here, but 123 and 11, over your coaching tenure. So my question to you is, is you're pretty dominant in your league. How do you go about scheduling non-conference games? I mean, when you look at your team from year to year and what you have and knowing what you might look like in conference, are you looking at non-league opponents and saying to yourself, I want to be a national contender here. I want to play teams that we might see in a second round or we might see in a third round. I mean, what is your, what is your thought process in kind of making that non-league schedule? Yeah, I thought early on when I was at Endicott, you know, 98, 99, 2000. And then after that, we played a schedule where we just needed to get wins and we needed to show that we were successful. I think programs that 
don't get off to a hot start, particularly a, a new program. You get caught in that mold of not being good, you know, and that's tough to recruit to. So I, I thought if we just scheduled appropriately to our level and we could get a lot of wins early on, um, we could at least attract young men that wanted to be a part of a winning culture. And every year from 2001 on, we would just add one, two, three tougher nationally ranked opponents to our non-conference schedule. So the non-conference schedule is what you get. You got to play it. And those are the most critical games to win. You got to win your conference to get into the, the NCAs. But we started scheduling teams like Springfield and Tufts and Williams and Amherst and Bowdoin and Salisbury State. And the list goes on and on. And the objective was to just get a couple of those guys on the schedule. So then you're attracting, again, that higher recruit that they see you're winning. They see you're playing a good schedule. And then what? So we took some lumps against some of those really good teams that we scheduled. Um, and, and then we started to just, we started to beat a lot of those nationally ranked teams. And, you know, that's when we really got it rolling then that we were pre pretty consistently in the top 15, top 10. Uh, I think our highest ranking was fifth or sixth in the country. Um, and that's just kind of the philosophy we took it in building it to, to get to where you want it to be. Yeah, and that's awesome. I mean, I didn't even think of that aspect of it to be like, well, these are the teams that we're playing and we're still, you know, five, six, seven, eight games above 500 and playing the competitive and playing the NCAAs every single year and kind of just to piggyback off of what you said. I mean, you have nine NCAA tournament appearances, 01, again, that 04 to 07 run, 10 and 11, 14 and 15. And you also have five NCAA second round appearances, 05, 10, 11, 14 and 15. So just, you know, consistency. I mean, that's, that's probably the key word there of how consistent you are as a coach and how consistent your program is. Um, you know, and it takes its lead from its leader. So um, awesome job. And, and again, just looking at those numbers, I had to read them twice sometimes. I'm like, did I read that right? You know, because they're just that impressive. Um, and then I know you're not big into um, individual accolades, but there is, you know, a question I wanted to ask you. Um, the New England Intercollegiate Lacrosse uh, Association, we read this off earlier at the, at the beginning of the podcast when we were introducing you. In 2014, you won Coach of the Year, um, which, you know, I think we've had a lot of coaches on the years of different things, so I understand the meaning of Coach of the Year. Um, I was wondering the next year when you won Man of the Year. Um, talk about those two awards, winning Coach of the Year, then winning Man of the Year, because to me, like, coaching is all about the man that you are and how you represent yourself and carry yourself as an adult that kids can look up to you or young adolescents or college kids look up to you and they see how you carry yourself and live your life and continue to do that through your program. Um, so talk about how big it is winning those types of awards um, again, just knowing how hard you work. I mean, you're a hardworking guy. I mean, you're on social media doing a million things all the time. You seems like you coach a million different teams. You're, you're, you're so involved with lacrosse uh, and I love it, but uh, you know, seeing those two awards just really stood out to me. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. You know, I look at one, one of the greatest accolades that you can receive as a player is to be named captain um, because that just shows a, a lot about, your leadership, your, your character, your integrity, and what you represent, certainly as a player, but more as a young man or as a young woman. Um, and I think when you start to get those honors, like player of the year or all league or all American, those are based more on talent and your, your numbers that you put up and the teammates that help you get to that point. So I look at that award of man of the year more as like a captain award of that is you're elected you're selected you're you know voted upon by your colleagues in the coaching profession not necessarily on, on wins and losses but more so what you do for the game what you do for the student athletes what you stand for as a man or a woman um and what you represent so you know, I was extremely humbled and honored to receive that, especially in my yet last year of coaching college across. Um, and again, it comes back to those relationships that I had and still have with all those players um, for so many years that, that I was a part of that as much as a coach gives, 
it's unbelievable what I would learn from my student athletes and how much they would give me. Um, so it's not just the coach giving and, and providing. It, it's really so much I look at how much I received and have learned from those players and families over the years, you know, to, to be honored with something like that award. Yeah, I mean, to me, it was just like when I saw man of the year, I was like, wow, this is unbelievable to win it back to back years, but obviously coach of the year and then man of the year and to see that it belongs to the same association. I just wanted to give you that chance to talk about it because, you know, that's an honor. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, like you said, winning games is great and, and individual accolades, it's what they are. Uh, but when you win stuff like that, it's about your character and who you are a little bit more. I just think those, those awards, those individual awards hold a little bit more power than most things. So um, awesome. That's great. That's great phenomenal um so in 2016 you know you kind of decided to maybe say hey this at the time the boston cannons job opens up you're at endicott um i'm gonna ask you i guess as two parts one just what maybe made you say huh i've had the success at the college level i have a pretty great po program here um we we have good recruiting we play good schedule i think i can make that jump to becoming a professional coach and then two, just a process of it. Like, I'm just really curious, just as like a fan of sports in general, how a professional interview and a whole process works. Yeah. You know, it was a really, it was one of the toughest decisions I made, Anthony, to step down as the head coach at Endicott in the spring of 2015. And it was for a number of reasons. Um, you know, mostly my family, my kids were young. I wanted to be around a little bit more uh, and that sort of thing. So ultimately that was May after we lost in the second round of the NCAA tournament to Cortland. And that summer, you know, I continued on with working camps and, and running my camps that, that I run and, and own. Um, and in late August, the Boston Cannons job opened up. John Tucker, who was the coach, had led that team to a semifinal appearance that year, took a similar role with the Atlanta Blaze as head coach and general manager. And at the time, Kevin Barney, who's a Springfield alum, was the general manager and vice president. And Ian Frenette, who was, again, a Springfield alum and president of the Boston Cannons, um, Kevin Barney and I had, had a conversation. Um, we had a cup of coffee. I went in, I met with him. He had a number of candidates that he was obviously looking at for that position. And one thing led to another. He offered it to me. I, I sat down with my family and discussed it. And, you know, I, I think when I got out of college coaching, they didn't pressure me to get out of college coaching. It was totally my decision. Um, but I think they missed, you know, dad being the coach too. Um, and they were more than, a, more than supportive, a hundred percent for me to get back into it pretty quickly. Uh, I never envisioned that I would one, get back into coaching that quickly. And I never envisioned it being at the professional level. Um, you know, I, I always thought maybe, all right, at Endicott, whoever becomes the head coach, maybe I help them out someday you know, coach the goalies a little bit here and there. Um, but I, I never really envisioned getting back into coaching at the college level or the pro level. Um, and here we are six years later, you know, and I'm still in it. And it's, it's my passion, man. It, it's, it, it's what I was meant to do. It's what I love to do. Um, and, and that's plain and simple. You know, I, I think I'll always, always be a coach. Um, in some way. Yeah. I mean, and that's real cool. I mean, here they are getting to see dad at the college level and now they're seeing dad at the professional level, you know? So it's like, yeah, my dad's a professional coach. You must be like the dad that they want to bring in for show and tell all the time or tell me what my parents do for work. Right. You know, I mean, not now with COVID, but, um, but yeah, that's, that, that's great coach. So you jump into that process. You, 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 you know, you get through the interview process, you now take over as coach, but you're also still working at Endicott. So, uh, how do you balance that? I mean, how do you balance being a professional coach, but still having a full-time job? Yeah, you, you know, I'm really fortunate that Endicott has supported me to have this position with the Cannons, uh, now in Premier Lacrosse League as well. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about the pro season is 
we start Memorial Day weekend and then we finish first, second week of September. So in terms of there not being a lot of overlap, obviously, you know, I'm working at Endicott during the summer and, and that sort of thing. Um, but it's, it works out perfectly from June until early September with the schedule that I have at, at Endicott. So yeah. I'm really fortunate in that regard. Um, and you just start to balance things, right? You start to balance your life and that work-life balance and your home balance and all the other things that you have going on. Wow. Yeah. And, and it's just like uh, hearing you do all that talk and I'm just like, wow, how does this guy balance this all? I mean, you know, still being a professional coach and still working at the university, and obviously, you know, helping out, I'm sure with all the, all the programs, but obviously lacrosse and as much as you can with everything. So I just, like you said, it's your passion and you love it. You can tell just talking to you. And if you look at your social media, it's the same thing. You just, that's what attracted me to you. It was just like your passion and love for it. It was just so obvious. Um, when you take over a professional program, it, it's different than I'm sure at the college level um, because now you're adding in maybe a draft, free agents. So talk about the adjustment you had going from Endicott as a college coach of, you know, the recruiting's probably somewhat the same for free agency, but as far as the draft goes and evaluating a roster and, you know, maybe be limited to the amount of people you can actually have. I mean, talk about that whole, just that whole process of change for you. Yeah. Yeah. It- it was a, it was a big adjustment, Anthony, you know, going from coaching college to coaching the pros, um, not so much the level of play and that sort of thing, but instead of dealing with 17 to 21, 22 year olds, you're dealing with 22 year olds to 38 year olds. Right. And, um, you know, they're grown men. They, they, they obviously perform at the highest level. They train at the highest level. Uh, they're extremely accountable for themselves. Um, they've been to the, the biggest universities and have had the, the best coaches in the game. Their IQ of their sport is through the roof. Um, the biggest adjustments are, are managing players, number one, and two, then preparing for different drafts, whether it be an expansion year where expansion draft happens, um, an entry draft, and obviously the collegiate draft is doing your homework on all those players, talking to coaches as you would as a college coach recruiting. Um, and you got to land those picks. I mean, it's, it's a, and any professional sport, you got to hit the money on what your needs are. Um, you, you know, best value for those guys uh, best available at times, even if it might not be a necessary need on your roster, you got to go with best available at, at times. Um, so learning that process was definitely a curve. And I'm a, I'm a very pragmatic coach in the sense that I lean, I expect a lot out of my assistant coaches, and I give them a lot of autonomy to do their job. That's why they have their position. And I also extend that to my captains, my leaders of the team. And those are guys that in my first year with the Cannons, I really went to, you know, guys like Mitch Belisle and um, Max Siebel, who are vets in the league and were on Team USA, Brody Merrill, who's a veteran on Team Canada, guys like that, I really went to. And the four most powerful words in the English language is, I need your help. And although I was their head coach and general manager, I still needed their help and I needed their trust. I needed their buy-in. I needed their respect for us to be successful as an organization and as a team. And I just asked them, how do you go about things? Um, you know, what do you think about practices? And because the practices are, are different than college and that sort of thing. The training is different. Um, and I grew a lot just from my players. You know, I said it about learning from my college players. Uh, I grew tremendously from those guys uh, and, and all my players on the Cannons. I grew from learning from the front office, how they do things and that sort of thing. So definitely an, an adjustment, um, but you got to be an active listener. It's not always about speaking. You, you got to listen, open up your ears and, and take everything in and then filter it how you want to be to uh, ultimately build what you want to build. 
Yeah. And all the successful coaches I've had on here, that's kind of been the one key thing that I keep hearing is being a listener, listening to what your team has to say, listening to what your leadership has to say. And, you know, as a coach, you said, being a captain is, is a very, very important responsibility of a team. You are leading your team down a path based off of the leader who's the head coach and making sure that people are holding themselves accountable and holding each other accountable for things. So absolutely. I love it. You ask for help. I mean, at the end of the day, that's the most important thing to do because those are the guys that you're going to lean on, like you said, for games, for practices, for things off the field, for leadership, things on the field, for working, you know, extra hard or whatever that is. So great. Um, you mentioned assistant coaches, you know, and, and obviously you, you, you lean on your assistant coaches, but you also give them a lot of, a lot of, you say rope to maybe do their thing. Um, Talk about the process of hiring professional coaches, assistant coaches, guys around you or women around you that um, have a vision, that have a vision of, of what you want, what you want to build and how you want to do it. Yeah, I, I've, you know, been through the process of hiring assistant coaches a, a lot. Um, I've had, you know, a fortunate situation, particularly with the Cannons that John Kopaki, he's been with me my entire time with the organization. Um, but I had a number of other coaches, you know, as well. And I, I think anytime you're looking to hire an assistant coach or a strength coach or a staff member, that's going to be on your staff directly, that's going to have contact with the players is they're an extension of you. And not every coach on the staff has to be alike it's good to have kind of different personalities and different objectives and different uh, outlooks and views on things. You don't want yes people that are just going to always yes the head coach. You want them to be able to respectively challenge you and have discussions about decisions that, that are being made. Um, and that's the input that I look for with my staff, certainly. And that's some of the things that I talk about, you know, when looking to hire coaches. Um, and they just got to be really good people. Honestly, at the end of the day, they have to be really good people with high integrity, high character, willing to do the right thing in difficult and challenging situations, um, to do things really ethically and not go astray and, and cheat in, in ways that aren't appropriate um, at the college level or the pro level. Um, that integrity is everything. And I've been really, really blessed to have tremendous coaches with me at, at every level I've been at. Um, and, and those are young, you know, people that I want to see grow and, and, and be on and be head coaches. You know, it's, uh, I would love for guys to stay with me for a lifetime, but at, at the time, uh, I also want them to grow. And if they aspire to be a head coach, that's part of my job as the head coach is to, to provide them opportunities to, to do that. No, that's great. I mean, I, it, you're, sometimes you're only as good as your assistant coaches, right? And getting them to buy in is, you know, it's kind of sacrificing a little bit who they are to, to buy into something maybe a little bit bigger. So that's great. The process that you go through, I think it's so important, even for those young coaches out there to hear that might make that jump, say at a high school level, of who do I want to surround myself with to, to have the most successful program possible? Um, and it seems like kind of your magic number is two to three years when you take over a program. So, you know, you take over in 16 and 19, you make your first appearance in the playoffs under you and then in 2020 you guys went on to win the championship now just curiosity i mean how does your 2020 season look in covid and you know what you guys were dealing with winning that championship that season um was it a shortened season how did the playoffs work i was just really curious because when i was doing my homework i couldn't find a lot of that and i was curious how you know the professional lacrosse league handled that yeah so we uh you know when covid hit in what march uh just about a year ago we were planning on a full season, 15 games, and then playoffs, obviously playing in cities all over the country. And as, you know, the country, the world was getting worse and worse with COVID, the, the uh, commissioner and office and owners of all of the teams decided to go into a bubble season. Um, much of like what you saw um, with professional basketball and other sports. And we went into a two and a half week bubble season in Annapolis, Maryland, where it was obviously a shortened season from 15 games to eight games. And 
Um, that included the playoffs. And we were really all of our, so we didn't have a traditional training camp before that. Um, so we had to select our rosters, 40 players. We had to get that down to 25 players sight unseen which we had a lot of guys back from our 2019 season that went to the semifinals against the Denver Outlaws. So we we're in a pretty good position, but we took some risks on some guys that, that weren't on our roster the year before um, through free agency, some that we, that we traded for that, that we knew would fit right into our system and, and that sort of thing. Um, and we went into the bubble season. We were really confined to the hotel where we were with our team, uh, with our medical staff, with our front office, and we ate there. We, all our laundry was done there. Our doctors were there, and we were at the stadium. So we were really back and forth, and those were two, the only two places we were able to go. Um, you know, we could certainly leave the hotel and go for a run, um, you know, go for a walk and that sort of thing, but, you know, we couldn't go to restaurants. So we couldn't do things that people were still doing at the time in July. Um, but it was an amazing experience, you know, to be with our team for that long, rather than just, you know, game weekend and, and that sort of thing. Those relationships really grew. Um, and we had a blast that, you know, obviously winning the championship culminates that. Um, but it, it was a blast, um, you know, being with our guys for, for that long of a, a period. And we stayed safe and it was a huge success. And then after that, um, you know, we, we celebrated a bit as a team and then we got back to our, our regular day lives. We were tested regularly down there and that sort of thing. But when we got back to our regular lives, you know, things started to pick up when we got back with the new season, then you start to get ready for re-signing guys that, that contracts were up and all that good stuff. And then in December, Major League Lacrosse merged with the Premier Lacrosse League. And that's where we are today. So those two, two leagues merged and uh, the Cannons are one of the expansion teams that, that are going into the 21 season now. Wow. And, and, and I love when you said that, because I was going to ask you that. I mean, the bonding experience in that bubble, I mean, watching the NHL and watching the NBA, it just seemed like guys were having fun as a team, especially younger teams. You know, these guys are young and they're, they're having fun together and they're all over social media or doing things together as a team and winning a championship, being in a bubble style like that, I think was probably the thing I took the most out of all these sports being in bubbles. It's like you come out of there feeling good about your team. Everyone's getting along with each other. You, you, you had a, a rare experience with each other that you might never have again. And on top of it, you want a championship doing it. It's a lot of sacrifice from everybody leaving their families and not being around. Um, so that's pretty cool stuff, coach. Um, I like, I, I was joking when someone was asking me about you coming on the show the other day, I go, this guy's like the Michael Irvin of lacrosse. He wins one like at every level. I mean, talk about, and I know you're not an individual accolade guy, but I just want to hear, I mean, talk about winning a, a championship as a head coach at the highest possible level of the sport that you love at the absolute highest possible level. Um, it must be a pretty amazing feeling coach. It is honestly, there's no, no two ways around it. Um, you know, every championship that you win, they're all special and they're special in, in different ways. You know, when we're doing that at, at the college level um, and we put a lot of work into building this Cannons team to, you know, have a, a really great successful 2019 season and come up short in, in that year. Uh, the season's a grind, right? You're, you're traveling for 15 weeks around the country playing these games. And, you know, the, the bubble season, as I look back at it, I don't care what professional sport it is. A lot will say, you know, does that have an asterisk nest next to it? Because it wasn't a full season, right? Yeah. 15 games. And I really mean this when, when I say it to people is in some ways, I don't want to say it's more challenging and more difficult than doing it, but in some ways it is. Um, you know, we, we played eight games in, I think it was like 11 days. Pro lacrosse, you're playing one game a week for the most part. It, it's like the NFL. Um, you know, it's a rough physical game. Guys got to 
um, recoup, they got to re-energize, they got to recover to play that next week and get ready through practice and everything else. So it was really demanding and it was really emotional winning that championship because we were such a tight knit team in 2019 and we came up short and then to do it with so many of those players again in 20 um, was just unbelievably special. It, it really was. We had uh, we had a, a beautiful ceremony several weeks ago with our entire team where our owner, Rob Hale, um, was on that really just in he's partial owners of the Boston Celtics as well. Just a, an unbelievable supportive gentleman. Our, our front office was there, our players, and he got the most gaudy rings that you would see at any level. I mean, they are golf ball size. <laughs> and uh, you know, that was really a special event um, for our players and coaches and everyone, but, yeah, I'll be honest, man, that, that, that championship was sweet. And to do it at the pro level is really um, is special, as I said. But I hate to say this, it's behind us now. We're looking at the next one, you know, and I'm grateful for 2020 championship, but we got our eyes on 2021 big time, and that's all we're shooting for now. Yeah. And, and I get it, you know, you, you enjoy it a little bit, but then it's back to the grind. Like you said, when you got back there, it was about, you know, signing guys and free agents and draft and evaluation and everything else. So, you know, it's, it's a busy 365 day job, you know, day a job a year. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, the process of that, right? So, you know, you, you, everybody's 2020 was kind of crazy, right? And your 2020 obviously was crazy, but it came with a lot of, I mean, you want to, you want a championship. Um, you also won at, the, at that year, the 2020 coach of the year um, in major league lacrosse. Right. Um, and then obviously um, in, and this is one I want to ask you about, cause I see you wearing the shirt there, the new balance shirt, you had won 2020 new balance coach of the year. Um, I mean, talk about that last award award because you, you won so many league championships and coaches a year. You're probably like blah, 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 blah. But talk about the new balance award. I mean, that is, that's a pretty wide range of coaches and sports. I'm sure that it goes across. So winning that, I mean, how special was that? I mean, again, I know you're not a big individual accolade guy, but uh, again, pretty cool awards you win coach for sure. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's, I was obviously honored by it. I'd been up for the award you know, previous years and never received it and didn't think much of it because again, I'm just, I'm chasing championships, you know, and to get it in a year that we did win the championship was pretty special. Um, but again, it, honestly, I, I don't just say these things. It, it comes back to the players. Number one, our, our coaching staff that um, the sacrifices that they all make and I had the best coaching staff in, in Boston for several years um, that just stuck by me and believed. And obviously, you know, this year's coaching staff is what it was. And, um, you know, I'm humbled by it. Um, I'm proud of it, obviously. But again, it's all about just winning and, and the guys and striving to get championships. Yeah. And you've done a great job of a coach through your entire career, you know, as a player, as a coach at the you know, collegiate level, and then obviously at the professional level, what's your, what's your advice to young coaches out there? You know, guys and girls who are looking to make a, a jump into their sport and be involved in it, whether it's at a high school level or a college level. I mean, what's your advice to them as far as the work and grind that goes into everything? Uh, I, th I think Anthony, that's a, it's an amazing question because I got into coaching, you know, as I said, because of my experiences, I, I loved playing the game. I had fun. Um, you know, I wanted to play in college and uh, it, it allowed me to grow so much as a young man through failure, adversity and success. And the thing I can say, and I say it to my own kids who, who are athletes and kids that I coach at a young age is you got to love playing the sport you know, don't ever look at it as a job or your parents are doing it for their reason to live through their eyes. You got to love playing the sport. And you know, as a coach as well, you can see those kids that are just loving it. And you don't have to be the best player to love it. 
you, you get out there and, and you learn lessons and you're a part of a team. Let's face it, when you graduate college, you got to go be part of a team in the business world or as a teacher or as a nurse or as a police officer, or as a lawyer, or whatever it is you're going to do, you got to be part of a team. And that's what sport teaches you is how to be a teammate, how to be a good winner, how to be a good loser. Um, and you just love playing the game and you try to go to the highest level you can. Um, but if it means playing club in college, great. You're still playing. If you're playing D3, great. If you're a scholarship division one athlete, great, but it's not about always chasing that scholarship. Um, and those are far few in between, right? Everyone thinks they're going to get a scholarship for coaches. Um, I'll say that again, I can clearly say this to you straight in the eye that I have never belittled, degraded, diminished a, a player uh, on any level. Um, with language uh, abuse, you have to treat your athletes at any level with respect. And you might raise your voice, but you, you never belittle them or do those other things. They're human beings and they're playing a sport that you want them to love. And if you want them to love the sport, you're going to treat them with respect. Um, and you got to have fun as a coach. You, you got to make some practices fun. You, you know, I do it at the pro level. You, you know, I, I do some goofy things with our guys that, uh, you know, lowers the temperature in the room at, at times. And I think things like that are important. And the second piece as a coach is you never sacrifice your integrity or your character to try to win games. You never go to break violations or, or cheat or to have recruiting violations or play players, you know, if it's not in the best interest of them, if they're injured or they're not in a good mental state, you can't try to win at all costs. You gotta be a, a person of high character, integrity, and do what's best for the team and, and your athletes. Yeah, it's great advice, coach. That's awesome advice. I'm sitting there, I'm just nodding my head to a lot of things that you're saying. And, you know, as far as your athletes go, you know, at the end of the day, like we talked about, you're the leader of this program, whether it's at the college level or the pro level. And these guys are looking to you for guidance and they're looking for you for leadership and belittling them or putting them down is just not the way to go. It's about being able to coach, lead. And like you said, sometimes the failure is the best part about coaching because now you know how to, what you need to do to get better and how you got to do it to get better. And that's how you learn as a team or learn as a program. Awesome. Uh, the last question I'm going to ask you before we jump into our two minute drill is, you know, you kind of alluded to a little bit before, but just sacrifice. I mean, you're very involved in the lacrosse cross world. Um, you know, you have your, you're the director of your uh, elite uh, 100 lacrosse camp. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about that um, as well, but just, you know, the sacrifice that goes into it, you are very much involved in now, even at the youth level, I see just on social media, you're very involved with youth level lacrosse. I mean, the sacrifice you've made in life, you know, family, friends, loved ones, everything to really do the thing that you love the most in the world. Yeah. You know, what, one of the things that I've always not preached, but built upon with our programs, whether it be at the college or the pro level is family. We want our team to be a family. And I think that's, that's overused in sports now. Um, but it, it's something we've talked about for 25 years in our programs. And it stems from my relationships with my own family. Um, family is literally everything to me. They've been extremely supportive throughout my entire coaching career. Uh, my wife and I started dating when uh, I, I was a, an assistant coach at Springfield. So she kind of knew the landscape and lifestyle of it. And she's been right by my side ever since and supported me in that way. Uh, my kids love it. They're lacrosse players themselves, and they love being around it. They go to all the games. They, they go to all the camps and clinics that I run. Um, so I'm really blessed in that sense that even though I'm working in a lot of the venue type of things, I've been able to include my family in them. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty private person for the most part with my family. But that's something I, I love to expose them to is, you know, going to those type of, of events and, and clinics um, and that sort of thing. So, you know, like we talked about earlier, Anthony, I, I've, it's my passion. It's what drives me. Um, I think it, 
it makes me a better husband. I think it makes me a, a better father um, in a lot of ways um, that I can just relate to coaching and parenting and giving examples to my kids about athletes that have succeeded on and off the field and that have had failure with poor decisions that they've made and how it's changed or ruined their life for the worse or for the better. So I think it's brought a lot of education moments into our home. Um, I, I do run Elite 100, which is uh, probably one of the nation's largest recruiting events for high school senior or student athletes uh, at Endicott. We run Peak Goalie, which is a goalie specific camp. Um, this is our 30th year running that. Uh, that was a camp that I attended. And then I eventually bought and took over with Eric Haggerty, who's my partner with that and the head coach at Endicott now. So we do a lot of fun stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. It's great to see. I love it. I mean, that's why I fell in love with coaching just to be so involved. And you can see that you just, you're so passionate about it, but you're so you're like, you love your players, you know, you love your players and you love coaching the sport you love and anybody who loves it, you can just see it's infectious. And that's why I really wanted to get you on the show. And I appreciate you coming on. Um, we're going to jump into our two minute drill. Okay. So this is our last segment of the show, just rapid fire questions about the sport that you coach and played. Um, you know, I do get a booth review. If I want you to explain something a little bit more, I'll give you the opportunity to do so and vice versa. If you want to explain something a little bit more, you most certainly can. Uh, so let me just uh, set the timer here and, and here we go. What would you say um, as a coach was your biggest win at the collegiate level? Uh, definitely beating Tufts when they were number one in the country and coming off a national title game. Very good. Yeah, you guys had some battles with Tufts, huh? When I was doing battles. my homework, absolute battles. It was great. I was like, I want, I, I should have asked you more about it, but uh, maybe off screen we'll talk a little bit more. Um, biggest save you had as a player ever that you can remember? Uh, you know, it, honestly, it was my first start my sophomore year. I let the first four shots of the game in against the Air Force Academy. And then I made that save on the fifth shot. And that's what triggered me the rest of my playing career to just say, make the first save. And that first save I, I made as a starting goalie was something I'll always remember um, and, and really allowed me to, to grow as, as a goalie to, to always remember to make that first save. Awesome. I love it. Um, one word you would use to describe your style on the sideline. Passionate. What would your player say? Out of control. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say out of control, but then I resorted to passion. No, you know, I'm a, I'm a fiery guy. Um, I can be very laid back, um, but I, I can get fired up pretty well. Uh, what, was the, what, was, uh, what was the biggest shock jumping into professional coaching? The biggest shock? Yeah. Like when you got um, the job, you were there, you started doing it like, whoa. Yeah. That's a lot. Know. You know, I think, like I said, the, the level of play from college to pros, the, the skill level and the intensity out on that field is off the charts. It, it's off the charts. So really that intensity and, and the speed of the game is at a completely insane level. That's awesome. Um, what would you say was the biggest win of your professional career? Got to go with the championship. Right. That's what I kind of figured. I kind of figured. I didn't know. Some coaches always say the first one, so I wasn't sure. Uh, last question. Best defensive player you ever coached? Oh, uh, it's an unfair question. Because, <laughs> again, you can pick a few. You can pick a few if you need to. You know, there's so many great ones, but Brody Merrill, who uh, he'll, he's 38 years old now. He'll be 39 in uh, – in November, November 5th is his birthday. He's, he's a legend and he's, you know, played at Georgetown university, played for team Canada. He's an all pro member of the cannons. Um, probably the greatest defenseman long stick midfielder to ever play. And to have a guy like that in your locker room that you can learn from. And that's almost like a, uh, he's a, you know, a leader, but he's got such an eye for the game. It's like having a coach on the field um, and coaching college. I just had so many great guys and, and great players um, that they're all really special. 
Awesome. Well, coach, you survived the two minute drill. Um, and, and I just wanted to thank you for coming on. I know that you're an extremely busy person. I have this small little podcast that's starting to grow and to have someone of your status come on here and just be so po- supportive of the show. Like I truly appreciate it. This was a great interview. I loved your answers. I loved, I loved everything. It was everything I expected. So um, I really appreciate you taking the time today and coming on. Well, Anthony, th- this was awesome, man. And I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed our conversations prior as well, and congrats on on six months, you know, and look at your podcast as, hey, this is the first six months. What are the next six months going to look like? You're going to keep building this thing and and growing it, and you're killing it. Keep crushing it out there, man, and uh, I'll continue to watch all the guests you have. I I love watching them, and uh, I don't care what level coaches – you have, whether it be youth, middle school, high school, college, or, or the pros, you're always learning from different people. And uh, you have you have great guests on your show and uh, look forward to catching up some more. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. As I said, just absolutely humbled. Uh, perfect guest to have on at the six month mark. And yeah, we'll see what the next six months bring, but I'm excited for it. So uh, thanks a lot again. And from Beyond Podcast, I'm your host, Anthony Petrella, Sean Quirk. Thanks for coming on. Uh, Till next time, guys.